Hello everyone, Rob Guest from Football.London here and welcome to the latest episode of Gold and Guest Talk Tottenham, sponsored by NordVPN. Joining me as ever, it's Alice the Gold. Ali, I take it you're well? I am, I am. Probably a little bit better than you after the weekend's results, unfortunately for yourself and and your lots further up the country. Um, but yeah, I mean, in the Spurs world, everything is very, very good this weekend, obviously. Um, the men doing the business at Aston Villa, the women doing the business in real, you know, making history uh, in the Women's FA Cup by beating Man City in that amazing penalty shootout. Becky Spencer, what a hero with those two saves and they're through to semi-finals. I think we find out tomorrow who they'll be facing. So, yeah, in the world of Tottenham Hotspur, everything went exactly as, as hoped this weekend, probably better than hoped in some cases as well. And uh, yeah, we've got so much to talk about about that game. There, there were so many different facets to it and talking points, players that did well, red card, players that we thought Spurs players were going to target and they didn't bother in the end. We're not talking about you, Matty Cash, honestly. Um, and yeah, loads of good stuff to talk about. Lots of happy chat. Yeah, I mean, it was such a big game going into it. Uh, huge, if, huge if Spurs lost, there'd have been eight points behind Villa. They would have still had the game in hand, but then you've got quite a big mountain to climb in what remains of the season. And I mean, nothing in terms of the outcome, who's going to finish fourth, was going to be decided yesterday. But Spurs have given themselves such a good chance now to finish in the top four following a 4 0 victory. And <laughs> To be honest, I think you're going to find it extremely hard pressed to find anyone who predicted a 4 0 scoreline given yeah. what happened in the first half. Yeah, honestly. I mean, I, it's really difficult. I wouldn't say the first half was awful at all, uh, far from it. But obviously, um, Spurs weren't in the attacking third really clicking. The, the final ball was just off so many times. But actually, the rest of their play was pretty good. Um, I mean, their pressing was incredible. People have heard me say this before, but my word, my favourite version of Tottenham Hotspur is the aggressive pressing Tottenham Hotspur. We got to see that in its full effect. I love the fact that Postacoglu clearly said to the players, look, they played on Thursday night. Tough game away at Ajax. Go at them. You go at them for 90 minutes. They are not going to be able to handle it. And it was exactly what happened. I have never seen Villa look so blunt this season. This is a, one of the best teams in the Premier League this season. And at a place in Villa Park that, you know, they won 17 in a row before I think Newcastle ended that in January. But they still, you know, got a ridiculous record there. And Spurs pretty much restricted them to the odd chance that they gifted them themselves with the odd silly pass that didn't quite go there. Spurs went there and they were brave. They were aggressive. And yeah, first half, it didn't quite work in the attacking sense. But you know, yeah, as you say, second half, all bets were off. That that could have ended up 6-0, 7-0 in the end, the way they were going through. Villa just couldn't handle it. And obviously going with 10 men made it even more difficult for them. But I felt even before then, you know, Spurs were, were starting to carve them apart. And all four goals, real quality goals. They were all very Postacoglu-esque goals, you know, looking for the man inside, um, playing the ball in. Um, and I just think... It was a massive kind of afternoon for Spurs in the sense of, as you say, getting really pushing themselves into the reckoning up there. And also just, again, further proof that the Postacoglu way can work at the very best sides, regardless of how they play, how they've been playing, what their form's like, who they are. If you go there with that bravery, and look, it is terrifying at times. There's times when they're playing it out the back and I can kind of, you can hear the, the fans, the away fans, who were brilliant again. Uh, but you could hear them like, oh, oh. <laughs> you see, they could hear the nerves and the noises they make. But it works. It works. It's going to get caught out sometimes. We know it's going to. We see the best teams in the world that play out of the back do. They get caught at times. But the beauty of it is, and, and at times, it can look a bit like, oh, side to side, side to side, what's happening here? But it's so, I, I probably saw it even clearer yesterday at Villa Park than I've maybe seen it at some games at home, in that they were just Romero to Van der Ven, Romero to Van der Ven, just trying to tease Villa out of their kind of set pack that they were in. And the moment, it was often Romero, the moment he saw one of the midfielders came out of position, bang, the ball went either through the middle or quickly out to a fullback or a winger so they could get around that. It's all about probing for the space. So 
when you know fans wonder like oh why are they passing it around the back why are they still persisting with that it's like well first off that's the postacoglu way where you know kind of what are we two thirds through the season now if you haven't worked out exactly <laughs> that's how spurs are going to play under him i don't think you maybe ever, ever going to get it but on the other side as well it's about pulling the opposition out of their comfortable kind of formation that they're in and the moment they get that space it's almost like they like a snake they coil and just strike spurs uh, and they'll suddenly get behind them and that was exactly what happened in the second half i mean the piece of play for that first goal is phenomenal when you kind of watch it back i think i think kudoseski tries to play ball through quickly it gets blocked it plays a lovely one two with pedro poro knocks it down the flank to um, Pat Matasar, who's made a terrific run down there. And his ball into the box is is one of the balls of the season because it has to be on a sixpence. It has to be in this exact, oh, such a tiny point within the six-yard box for Madison, who's not the biggest player, but to stretch out a leg and get there before the two big, kind of, I think it was the centre-backs either side of him. It was a phenomenal goal. And I think that absolutely killed Villa. You know, you could talk about the second goal, which obviously coming so quickly after was probably that the hammer blow and, and the red card as well. But I think that first goal, Villa could just see like, wow, it absolutely ripped us apart. With We didn't even know it was happening. It was so quick. Um, and it maybe gave them flashbacks to the game at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium when they did that repeatedly, Spurs. They just didn't have the finishing touch. Um, so, yeah. Big day for Spurs. And it didn't look like it was going to be. It was a horrible, miserable day. A wet and gloomy day. Every, all of us travelling up there had to go really early because it was such a stupid kickoff time. But my goodness, it was worth it. What, what, a, what a performance as it went on. I was as uh, kind of vindicated, I think, everything that Postacoglu is working with them on. Yeah, I thought Villa had the better openings in the first half. And a lot of Villa's attacks just came from the long ball over the top, which you don't necessarily see a lot from them uh, this season. And Christian Romero had, you know, a couple of scares coming up against, you know, the pace and power of Ollie Watkins. And He let the ball bounce, didn't he? I think yeah, that was the yeah. problem a couple of times. I think one of them, when Van der Ven used his pace to come back, yeah. if Spurs didn't have, you know, someone as fast as Van der Ven, sense about then I think Watkins had probably got his shot away and then there was one uh later in the first half where Watkins again got the better of Romero uh, but Romero had turned and managed to get uh, a good block uh to Watkins effort but other than that Villa had you know some decent openings I think Matty Cash poked one just wide uh but it was really Luca Dean's chance towards the end, wasn't it? The first half, first half stoppage time from John McGinn's cross. What went wide of the tag? It wasn't any trouble for Guglielmo Vicario, but I mean that was really like probably the one decent half chance in the match. Uh, but you know, credit to Spurs, limited Villa to very little. Spurs themselves got into some good positions, but it was just that final bit of quality uh, that was lacking at times. And it's always going to be tough when you're coming up against a back five which Villa deployed and. I don't know if that was because how easy Spurs carried Villa open at Tottenham Hotspur yeah. Stadium back in November, or it was a case of Villa are quite short in midfield at the moment, and they're going to have limited numbers over the next few weeks with John McGinn now suspended uh, for three weeks. But yeah, uh, not the most eye-catching of first halves uh, in an attacking sense from Spurs, but straight after the whistle, they were on it, and I know. Dane Kuliseski struggled uh, in the first half, you know, to beat his man, uh, to make anything really happen. But that was such fantastic play for, from him uh, mm. to play that one-two with Poro, play Sarin, and, you know, full credit to Pat Matasar, who was off balance uh, a couple of seconds before getting that crossing. And yeah. that was like prime David Beckham, wasn't they? Just putting the ball on a sixpence oh, amazing. for yeah. uh, James Madison. And I'm sure if... Kevin De Bruyne had made that cross yesterday, then an awful lot more would have been said about it. It was absolutely fantastic. And then James Madison in the right place at the right time. And that just put Spurs on the way to claiming all three points of Villa Park. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, yeah, you're right. I think, I think it had, it had been a, a player that everyone kind of raves about and 
you know, Pat Matasar's 21 years old, 20, and he's doing stuff like that in the Premier League. It is scary um, just how good he's going to be and how much I think he adds to the team when he's in it. You know, as soon as he said in the Friday press conference, yeah, you know, he's he's feels more unrestricted this week with the back problem. It was like, I think you and I both knew that, right, right he's going to start them because you just need his mobility. And I don't think you could possibly showcase that any better than with the goal. Just the movement he's got, the tactical intelligence to know when to make that run. Um, and like you said with Kulusevsky, yeah, he was, I'd actually go as far as say he was dreadful first half. Every time he tried to attack his man, he got dispossessed. Every time it was, and I think that's the key thing with Kulusevsky is that he's got um, this real kind of battling tendency and he's, he believes in himself. So that even, you know, when you might be thinking, well, now's the time to bring on Werner, go with Werner and Johnson, take Kulusevsky off. He's got that ability to come up with some little bit of moment of magic or forward play. And, you know, he was involved in three of the four goals in the second half. He was you know, up there among the most influential players in the game in the end, all after a 45 minutes that was, yeah, really poor from him, I felt. Um, yeah, Spurs were excellent. I think the biggest thing for me was going there with the pressure they were under. Um, and, you know, this is not the first time this season, you know, they've gone to the Etihad, they've gone to the Emirates, uh, they've gone to Villa Park now. And, and in these big kind of games, I think it was Jack Pitbrook from the Athletic said, though, which I think he might be right. Is this the first team they've beat above them this season? Who was Liverpool. above them? At the time? I was wondering whether Liverpool. He oh, thought that Liverpool at the time, right? Yes, I think Liverpool weren't maybe at the time. Um, that Spurs might be when... probably top, weren't they? Yeah, yeah Spurs are September. flying high, and it's a great point. It is. It was kind of. It was probably the the biggest pressure game in that respect of kind of having to claw it back a bit. Um, and yeah, but, I mean, uh, it's it's not just beat them; it's beat them convincingly. Oh yeah, and kind of beaten by more as well. So yeah, that's a sign of things to come. Really, if everything yeah. clicks, it's the scoreline we should have had in the first game in the reverse yeah. fixture. Yeah, it yeah. is because you know they didn't take the chances, and in the second half they let them kind of get away with a couple of opportunities, and, and they ended up losing the game. Whereas this time they were brutal, and I love it when. Not only when Spurs are doing their aggressive pressing, which I just don't think anyone can live with Spurs when they do that. I mean, it's it's such a... I know it's a knackering tactic, but if you rotate your team properly and you can make enough subs during the game, which he did as the second half wore on, and, you know, they had eight days to prepare, to prepare, to prepare compared to Ajax's... Uh, Ajax. The <laughs> Villa's three days. Well, it was less than 72 hours they had. Um, you can absolutely get away with it. I'd love to see that for the rest of the season now. Spurs doing that in every game. But, um, you know, just just the belief in the way they play was superb. And, and the second goal as well, you know, that comes from the pressing. It all comes from Brennan Johnson pressing. The ball is pushed um, in a pass because he's running at the player. Kulisewski gets his foot in, gets the ball, which ends up being very kind of telegraphed, does well. Sonny runs on, knocks it inside to Brennan Johnson, who obviously kind of almost as he's falling hits a, a shot into the top corner. And he, uh, what do you think? Proved he's not a super sub? He's more than that? Yeah, very much so. Uh, to be honest, I would have kept him on the bench given Werner had scored last time out yeah, against Crystal I think Palace. A few people would, yeah. And because it has made a big impact from the substitutes bench in recent months, such as the Brentford and the Brighton games, Crystal Palace won as well. And it is an incredible weapon to have uh, because I think we're all expecting it to be a really tight, you know, cagey game going into maybe the final 20 minutes. Then you can bring Brennan Johnson on against the tiring uh, defence. But I thought from the first whistle, it was absolutely magnificent. I mm. think the confidence hadn't been in his game this season, but you could see it right from the off, uh, running at the Villa back line, making things difficult for for them. And it was a really well taken goal uh, as well. And I think that confidence has just gone to grow and grow in him uh, at the moment. He's having a big say in the final third with his goal involvement. Is it seven in total from his last 10 games? Yep. Uh, something like that. So, yeah, we might not have seen the Brennan Johnson that performed so well on the regular basis at Nottingham Forest so far. 
but the, the confidence is certainly seeping back into his game and that's only going to bird well, you know, in the remaining months of the season because I think there's still a lot more to come from him and I think he proved that, you know, he, he can start games. He's not just a super sub. Yeah, I mean, that's that was his third goal in six Premier League games. Like you say, seventh goal involvement is past 10 Premier League matches, four assists as well of those three goals. Um, yeah, he's, he's kind of doing a lot of the stuff we ask of him, really, or we hope from him. Um, it's not us asking him. It very much is Andrew Postacoglu. <laughs> he's not listening to us. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm delighted for him, to be honest. He's a very well-liked young guy around the club. He's a very willing learner, very clever guy. Um, kind of, uh, yeah, yeah, very popular figure behind the scenes and very much... I've said this before, but a, a real belief in kind of what he be, can become. You know, we're only seeing the very early version of Brendan Johnson right now. He's got all of the tools to be a, a, a real top player. Um, and I think it's it's not rocket science. When someone's confident, they're going to be better. Um, I kind of did, we have to do our halftime player ratings, which are just numbers. We throw them into our live blog. Um, and I did mine. I had him as the highest rated uh, attacker for me. I only had a six um, because the first half, obviously, they weren't finding a way through. But I had him as a six and, and all the other attackers, I think, were fives and I think I had Decky as a four. And I noticed, you know, sometimes you see the odd comment. Um, very very often I don't bother looking, but this one came through and it was whinging about the fact that I'd given Johnson such a high mark and he should be low. He was terrible in the first half. And I just thought he was leading the press so much. He was causing them so many problems and trying to beat his man down the left as well. He was the one that looked like something was going to happen from what he was doing. Um, and his touch was superb. He just kept dribbling past players with real ease. And it all comes from that confidence. He knows he can do it. And I think it's about having confidence in his own ability, having the backing of his teammates and the fans, who, let's be honest, haven't always had his back. Some of them, not all of them, but some of them. Um, and I think, yeah, a belief in his own body as well. You know, he hasn't had an injury for a while now, a uh, touch wood. He's kind of been able to uh, grow that little bit of trust back in his hamstrings and things like that. So, yeah, this for me was, was up there with one of his best performances, I thought. I thought he... Everything good they did kind of came down that side with him. And again, showed that, you know, I personally have always kind of preferred him on the right. But I actually thought on the left, he was superb. I thought he uh, shows his versatility as well. Um, I think he links up really well with Son. I think they've got a really nice kind of little partnership that's going as well. And uh, yeah, poor old uh, Matty Cash. Um, obviously, we're going to mention him a couple of times. He... Uh, yeah, he did not enjoy that. That was not a battle he enjoyed. And uh, I mean, I guess with Timo Werner, he would have had a similar kind of pacey, kind of problematic uh, winger to come up against. But I think with Johnson, is he can be a pest as well. And it is, it's that harassing nature. And we saw it against Palace. That was how Spurs got back in the game because he did that. Um, and he's he's kind of developed this side under Postacoglu of being a real irritant to the opposition. And that's that's perfect. Allied with his skill... And he's got so much ahead of him. Um, yeah, excellent. Really, really pleased for him. And uh, I think probably cements his, his place in the side again against Fulham. I don't think you can take him out of there. No, I, I think he, he starts. But Timo Werner's obviously given and something to think about as well. Uh, you got Dane Kulaseski making an impact in the final third. Like I said, you come into business end of the season, this is when you want all your attackers to be on song and yeah. it looks like at the moment potentially are going to be if they carry on playing the way they are at the moment. Uh, obviously, after that second goal, there was a, a bit of a talking point in the game. Uh, maybe for a some, bit. some some didn't think John McGinn shouldn't have been sent off. But Really? I think some were saying maybe not, but let's be honest. Wow. How, Destiny, your doggy, uh, still got two legs. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Honestly, he could have just taken it right off, given the power he came in. Uh, yeah. Ridiculous. It was just a brutal tackle from John McGinn, who was such a good player for Villa, such an influ influential player in the yeah. middle of the park. Uh, you know, really good on the ball, good pressing qualities, energetic, sets the tempo for Villa, but he's just like, 
just lost his head a bit there, just steaming in for a challenge, you know, nowhere near the ball. And yeah, right in front of the Tottenham bench, they weren't happy at all. Brennan Johnson, yeah. James Madison, Son straight in. Christian Romero pulling Douglas Louise back as well because he was trying to get involved. And then I don't think the referee had any other option but to brandish the red card. No, and there was this kind of ridiculous moment. It was right in front kind of of the press box. You could see it down there. He was heading off the pitch. And then I think he remembered the existence of VAR, John McGinn. And he stood kind of just on the pitch near the tunnel, just looking back as if to say, are they going to overturn it? They're going to overturn it. And Chris Cavan, the referee, just looked at him and just went, get off. <laughs> he just kind of waved it and pointed, just get off. Like you think that's ever going to get overturned? And he just kind of trudged off. And obviously, it's made all the more ridiculous by the fact of his comments before the game. You know, obviously, the quote that circulated where he said, everyone knows how important the game is. It's probably in a league fixture, the most important game in the club's recent history. The players are aware of that. I'm not entirely sure he seemed to be aware of it in that moment. Um, and like you, I think John McGinn's brilliant. I really think he could he could fit in most teams in the Premier League. I think he's a superb player. Probably one of the most kind of underrated ones. I, I think people maybe see him just as a bit of an all-round kind of uh, versatile player. When actually, I think he is, he's he's maybe one of the best midfielders in the Premier League, really. But that was so daft. It was incredible. It was so born of frustration. Destiny Adoggi had just raided up and down that left flank all day. He had the freedom of it, really. And he could see he was a mile ahead of him. And I didn't get... I mean, I guess there is no logic behind it, what he did. It just it was like a swipe of a kick. It was a really unpleasant one. And and you know, he catches him somewhere with his studs, he catches him on like he could have done anything. He could have taken his knee, he could have got his foot caught in the floor. It was just it was an awful challenge, really. Um I don't think it was done it really sounds weird to say, but I agree with Poscoga. I don't think it was done with malice. I don't think it was done to I'm gonna really hurt you. I think it was more done of I'm going to trip you up because you've frustrated me kind of thing. And, and, but it was excessive. It was, it was. And I love the fact that kind of a doggy jumped up immediately to have a right go. And then I think he realized two things, a, ow, this hurts. And then kind of secondly, actually, I think he was going to be in trouble here. And if I'm getting up and fighting with him, maybe I'm letting him off a little bit. Um, so yeah, he kind of let all his teammates do the the, the battling for him, and Postacoglu, as always, having to play the peacemaker and, and dragging people away and stuff. Um, and it's such a bigger consequence to Villa than just that game, because you know Postacoglu said afterwards, and I agree with him. I think Villa had lost already at that point. I think they were two 0 down. I think their heads had gone down. They were knackered. I think they would have. It might have stayed 2-0, who, who knows? Um, but I think the more damaging effect is the next three games. They lose their captain. They lose one of their best players. Um, and that's huge for them at a time when they've, you know, he'll obviously be able to play in, the, in Europe if they can get past Ajax. But to lose them in the next three Premier League matches when they're battling Spurs, who obviously, Spurs are going to be resurgent after they should. It would be classic Spurs if they then go and lose at Craven Cottage. But... You know, in theory, they should be flying after that result. Um, and then to have your captain not there to to lead you um, after a really disappointing result for them when they, you know, they did cap capitulate as well, Villa, in a way. You know, yes, he changed up the tactics. The local reporters there kind of felt like Emery uh, was responding. I, I take your point entirely. I do think squad-wise, it kind of would have helped his decision. But they were kind of suggesting that uh, it was a lot to do with the first game. Um, but it didn't work. It didn't work at all. And I, I think maybe that was part of the frustration McGinn had. But uh, yeah, it was uh, it was game over completely the moment he did that. Yeah, I think Villa have uh, West Ham away, Wolves at home, Man City away, their next three yeah. games. Yeah, I think it so is. You, I think you'd probably expect Villa to beat Wolves at home, probably on current form or form prior to yesterday's game to go and win at West Ham given their mixed fortunes but that's going to be very tricky now without John McGinn because uh, they've lost uh, Babukar Kamara for the season uh, I imagine Jacob Ramsey will be back but they're not blessed with a number of midfielders at, at the moment uh, 
So, yeah, that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. But all Tottenham can do is just, you know, carry on winning your games and see where that puts you at the end of the season. But, yeah, that's a red card that, you know, could have big consequences come the final day. So, with Spurs, you know, on top after that and having a number of opportunities to add to the scoreline, I thought it was going to be one of these where, I'm just really pleased with the win, but maybe a bit unhappy uh, and missing out on such a good opportunity in terms of swinging the goal difference right round because it, it was in the final few minutes in stoppage time where they did get the third and fourth goal. Did have quite a few attacks going forward. Uh, there was one where it fell to Dane Kulaseski on his right foot in the penalty yeah. box. You just think, just have a bit more confidence in in yourself you're in such a good position if you don't score you don't score keep it might palm out you don't know what it's going to lead to but as we've seen a number of times when Kulosevsky when he's on his right foot he tends to look for another option in the box and it didn't come yeah. to anything and then there was another opportunity where I think he had it had been Johnson and Sonny maybe either side of him but went for the shot himself went over <laughs> someone impressed at all uh, so that's a bit of an angry reaction from him but you know, uh, thankfully, he did the turn for that with a really good bit of play in stoppage time. Put the ball across for Son, who finished off expertly. And I think Son certainly deserved uh, a goal for his performance because he was really good in the second half. Definitely stepped things up. And Kulosevsky, uh deserved an assist to his name as well. Uh, as you said earlier in the pod, it's, it's one of these where sometimes he can, you know, be a bit quiet, not have a say on the game at all, but because he's got that quality in his locker, all of a sudden he can just spark into life. He might not get an assist. He might, you know, assist whoever gets the assist or whatever, but he does tend to have a big impact on the final third for Spurs. I think that was evident as well in the recent Wolves game at home where maybe he was a bit quiet in the first half, but then all of a sudden... Uh, got the equaliser for Tottenham with that fine goal, almost scored a second one. And I think that was the case at Villa where he's just quiet, but then he just bursts into a life all of a sudden, just makes things tick for Tottenham. Yeah, I think you know he's only 23 years old. I think there's still so much more he can add to his game. You know, obviously he kind of blazed such a trail when he first arrived in England and you kind of forget just how young he still is. And I think... He has to improve his unpredictability. You know, there are times we know he's going to cut in on that left. There's times when he'll hit the ball with his right and it's a bit of a kind of a, it's not the greatest contact. And I think that's something that he'll work to improve on because he is such a hard trainer. I think that's one of the biggest things with Kudusevsky is that he listens. Everyone that knows him says that. Um, I don't think it's any coincidence that in the second halves of the games, he's often stronger. He'll come out having listened to what Postacoglu's told him to do or the coaching staff have told him to do, and he'll go and do it. He's, I hope, will have seen what Richarlison's, uh, sorry, Richarlison, what um, Brennan Johnson's doing in, Brennan Johnson is turning up at the back post a lot now. He's really taken that on board that, you know, I need to be there when the ball's on the other flank. And I think Kudusevsky needs to get that into his head as well. Um, you know, he scores the odd goal. I mean, that was his first assist of 2024 yesterday. And for a player like him, yes, with everything else he brings, he can still improve his numbers. And I'm sure he would agree with that as well because he's a, he is a bit of a perfectionist. But uh, it was a good move for Son's goal and Son's finish. I mean, that is a player who just knows his level now. He knows that he is one of the best players the Premier League has. He's a world-class player. It's just like a rocket of a first-time finish. Um, he's now got 22 goal involvements in 24 games. Four in the Premier League, 14 goals, eight assists. He's now up to 159 goals for Spurs. Joint fifth top goal scorer of Cliff Jones. Um Someone said, I think it was a foreign Twitter account, so I had to translate it. They said they should have like a Spurs Mount Rushmore with like all of the different heads <laughs> of the top goal scorers. I'd love that. You imagine just going down Tottenham High Road and you suddenly see all these massive heads, Harry, big Harry Kane head. And uh, yeah, you'd have to have Sonny and Cliff Jones at the moment. I mean, maybe I actually say that. I was about to say Cliff Jones is maybe even more impressive because he's a winger, but then so Sonny being a winger for a lot of his Spurs career as well. So, uh, it may be quite fitting that the two of them are on the same score, although 
I'd imagine Sonny will uh, not be there for much longer. I think he will he will move on beyond that. But uh, yeah, Sonny's just was superb yesterday. He he was really good. His first half again, a bit like Johnson. It was all about the running. He was just constantly leading the press with Johnson, just running, running, running. Um, again. I only saw two comments about my ratings yesterday and they both made me laugh. The first one was about the first half one with Brennan Johnson. The second one was afterwards. Someone said, you've marked Sonny really highly. All he did was score a goal and get two assists. And I was like, yes. <laughs> that's kind of the point. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what he's meant to do. Um, I know he worked really hard around that. I didn't think that was all he did at all, but that did make me chuckle that you know it wasn't good enough that he got a goal and two assists. Um, yeah, he was superb. And obviously, turns provider with his second assist for Timo Werner. Um, both, again, as with the first goals, both three minutes apart. There's clearly something that uh, Villa um, have to concede a second goal three minutes later. Um, and Werner's finish was lovely, wasn't it? I thought that was the best finish of the day. Mm. Just opening up his body and curling it in with the right foot. It just had all, you know, the hallmarks of a player, you know, just thriving in confidence uh, at the moment and probably just shows the wonders uh, of that goal the previous week against Crystal Palace uh, because the goals had eluded him in his first six appearances at Tottenham, had contributed in terms of assists, but it's always goals. Attackers are going to be judged on uh, because he has missed some, you know, big opportunities as well at times. But yeah, really, really good finish uh, for him. I mean, we were speaking earlier in the day and Spurs having the option for what 15 and a half million it's just yeah. like just snap the hand off his peanuts really it was just you know transfer no brainer in today's market uh and as Ange said in his press conference on Friday yeah I think there's still an awful lot more to come from Timo Werner um in the remainder of the season I think he'll have more than two goals you know come the final game yeah, I mean, he's got four goal involvements in his first seven matches back in the Premier League. For a guy considered a flop, <laughs> that's not too bad. He's kind of come back and made an impact. Um, I suppose he should probably have another goal involvement to his name. Uh, in the Brentford game, he only got like one assist, didn't he? Was yeah. it a doggy's goal? They didn't go down as his assist or something, something like that. Something like that, yeah. He did lose one for no yeah. real kind of, yeah. Yeah, some sometimes they do kind of. There's like the slight uh, aspect to it. They don't believe it's an assist, or they don't believe it's this or that. And yeah, and you know my thoughts very well on own goals when they don't count as assists. It's just ridiculous. Um, but yeah, I think the biggest thing for Postecoglou, he did kind of mention it after the game, was all of the attackers scoring the goals, kind of all of them amongst them, or, or assisting the goals as well getting Madison back on the score sheet as well, I think was quite important. Getting Kudusevsky, like I say, that first assist to 2024, Johnson scoring again, Werner scoring again, you know, Werner and, and Son both scoring back-to-back games. It's This is it. This is um, Postacoglu's whole thing. It, and to be fair, he has been banging on about this since the start of the season that it's still not a Postacoglu team unless they are absolutely burying the opposition in a just a deluge of goals that is what they do they create so many chances so when we're seeing these games when there's you know there's not as many chances there's fewer chances and they're not um you know running these are the kind of score lines the four nils that i think his teams are more known to to kind of produce um so yeah he kind of said this team will have a, many more goals and, and when you look at it it's all about the competition isn't it as well because you know like we said at the, at the top of that, Werner or Johnson, either of them could have started. Uh, both of them end up scoring on the day. Kudusevsky brings so much to the pitch. Sonny, obviously, is just an absolute goal machine and assist machine. Uh, Madison scoring goals, assisting goals. Uh, Lacelso didn't even get a chance yesterday. And Lacelso, we know, can contribute. He had a little period where he was scoring goals as well for Spurs. Rodrigo Bentenko coming into the play. I thought he was quite bright when he came on as well, albeit obviously against 10 men, but I still felt like he was a constant threat as well. You've got Richarlison to come back into the mix, Mana Solomon to come back into the mix. And I still think in the summer that Postacoglu is going to bring in uh, one or two attacking players as well to uh, to mix it up even further. So uh, 
yeah, the joint fourth top scorers in the Premier League, Spurs, with a, a game in hand. So technically, they could kind of move beyond that. Um, but it just feels like when it comes to the attacking stuff, he's only just getting started. It's an area that, you know, he, Chris Davies and Ryan Mason are really working on the attack. Um, and you can start to see little threads of it. Some of the play was beautiful. Um, some of the, the movement. Like I say, it starts at the back as well. This is the kind of the, the joined up nature of it as well. With Matt Wells working with the defence, he not only works with him on the defensive aspect, he works on them, as with Chris Davies, on um, getting them to spring that ball quickly forward. And uh, it would be lovely if, like you call it, the business end of the season, if Spurs can kind of find their attacking feet right at the right point and they start racking up the goals now when the season goes on. Still obviously got some very tough fixtures, but, um, again, this should be an absolute proof to them. They can go anywhere and get whatever result they want. Well, Ange said back end of October, you know, the real growth is going to come in the attacking areas. Yeah, mm-hmm. Spurs had scored quite a few goals in the first part of the season, but I don't think yeah. things had entirely clicked. And I still don't think things have entirely clicked. Yesterday was, you know, a really, really good day for Spurs, but I think there's still an awful lot more to come. From the first attackers, that, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. First half showed the growth it needed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just getting the combinations right, and it's just going to come from game time and confidence as well. And you know, confidence is going to be there in the likes of Brendan Johnson, Timo Werner, Dane Kulaseski, Son, at the moment because they are contributing uh, in the final third. So yeah, I think the way Spurs are going at the moment. Yeah, hopefully it'll lead to good things come the end of the season. Right, we're about halfway through today's pod, so Ali, uh, do I let everyone know about the benefits of you using NordVPN? <laughs> yeah, not just me, everyone using NordVPN or anyone that can. I had someone on the uh, the trip up yesterday, actually, up up towards soggy Birmingham um, that was uh, kind of half joking about the whole NordVPN uh, discussion that we always have, but also saying that they used it because of that, and it worked really well for them. It's so funny. It's just, uh, as I said before, it kind of has become its own entity. Um, yeah, it's uh, so many people telling me they went on holiday and used it to uh, to watch stuff from back home. So it's great that we can help people out. It's great that Nord can help people out, and it's great for us as a podcast, really, because obviously – the more kind of Nord see that people are using their product because of our podcast, that kind of rebounds on us quite nicely and uh, and kind of just, yeah, strengthens our partnership with them as well for the future. So, I mean, look, it goes without saying, I've said it enough times, you know exactly my feelings on this. NordVPN is the fastest VPN in the world, which means there's no buffering, no lagging, and you can stream your favorite shows anywhere in the world without your bandwidth throttling, which I have done many times in many countries We're very fortunate through work to kind of was covering spurs to have, uh, have taken us around the world on their exploits and to be able to kind of use nordvpn to make sure i can always watch what i want from back home and also kind of make my phone a little bit more secure when i'm using public wi-fi wherever it is to stop people getting into it and uh, not only that but the outlay on a nordvpn subscription is cheap if you are in the long run and that's because you can purchase streaming services or bookings from other countries at a much cheaper rate so for example you can book flights from other countries which could be cheaper if you're booking them from those countries rather than from the uk so it means you're paying out for nord but you're saving money overall there's a whole host of other benefits from signing up to NordVPN, so why not give it a go? You can get the best discount off your NordVPN plan by going to nordvpn.com forward slash gold guest. There's no risk with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. And of course, as I said before, you're helping support the Golden Guest Talk Tottenham podcast by doing so. If you missed it just then, the link is in the episode description box. Amid all the positives to come from yesterday's 4-0 win at Aston Villa, there was one negative and that came a couple of minutes into the second half with Mickey van der Ven going off with what appeared to be a hamstring injury prior to then. For me, best player on the pitch by far. He was incredible. Just dropping another defensive masterclass uh, didn't on hand early on to deny Ollie Watkins. Uh, was in the right place. It was a Leon Bailey corner that looked like he was going to go right on Vicario uh, in the first half, headed that away. 
uh, clear the Matty Cash cross with Ollie Watkins lurking at the back and just showed his quality on the ball and then start the second half, good block on Matty Cash when he uh, you know, came inside and had an effort on his left foot and that block as well from Leon Bailey, which unfortunately led him going off the pitch. Uh, hopefully it won't be so serious, uh, but it's one of those we'll just have to wait and see uh, what happens, but you know, things could have gone the other way when Van der Ven went off, but thankfully uh, that wasn't the case. What did you make of his performance then, Ali, he yesterday? Was, he was excellent. <clears throat> he was superb. Um, he is one of the best young defenders in the world for me. Yeah. I, I think he is. You know, I think <clears throat> what he uh, brings to the Tottenham system is exactly what it needs. Um, his anticipation, his timing is superb. Even uh, and says himself that what he has done from the start of the season to now, the improvements are incredible. Obviously, we kind of have seen him as this consistent player, but he says behind the scenes, what he's learned and taken on board are just incredible, his rapid development. Um, and I do think at times it can look like he's bailing out Romero. Um, I think that's going to be a natural byproduct of the game that Romero's asked to play. He's often asked to play a slightly more risky game with his passing um, and his positioning as well. And I think it makes it look like, yeah, oh, Van der Ven helping him out, bailing him out again. I just think that's the way that the team is set up to almost, it's going to look like that. And I actually think Romero brings a lot to Van der Ven's game as a leader and a talker and an organiser. Um, and yeah, I was gutted for him. What wound me up again was it was another one of these stupid moments when a Offside is so clear, but the linesman doesn't put his flag up because they're not supposed to. They're meant to see it play out just in case, you know, they come in, VAR comes in, blah, 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 all of that sort of stuff. And that's twice now that Van der Ven has injured his hamstring, going in for a challenge for a move that was offside and he didn't need to make a move from. I wonder when that's eventually going to come to an end, this stupid thing. It could be that someone launches into a challenge for something or a goalkeeper comes rushing out for something that's clearly offside. I think maybe actually that happened with Vicario. Didn't he come rushing out for something and get clattered? Um, and it was clearly offside or maybe it was another goalkeeper. But maybe. Uh, I can remember one last season, Ben Godfrey at Everton broke his leg. Oh, Literally right. when there was uh, one of these, when I think it should have been offside and they kept play going and yeah, eventually broke his leg. So <laughs> yeah, there are, examples but i think it's one of these ways just coming cost of var isn't it yeah uh, oh yeah yeah because you just don't know whether the decision's right or not and you've got to let play go but there's examples when it is just like blatantly obvious and you're thinking yeah. why on earth are you just putting your flag up and then the players end up having to go with the linesman but yeah someone is going to get injured <laughs> really well, you've destroyed my point, unfortunately, because <laughs> I was going to say maybe it was going to take an off, like a really bad injury for them to reconsider it. But clearly, if, if Godfrey's done it, 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 it meant nothing to them whatsoever. Um, but yeah, I did find that frustrating, although it was quite interesting. The um, Tom Barkley from the Sun stayed out at half time. We all went inside because it was miserable and wet. I was where I was sat at Villa Park, it was dripping from the roof onto my laptop and my head. And I was like, no, I've got to get inside at half time. But he stayed out there uh, and he saw Radu Dragerson going through a really kind of intensive half-time um, one-to-one session with one of the coaches. Um, so it maybe suggests that Van der Ven had mentioned that he had something, he could feel a little bit of tightness perhaps, I don't know. Um, and then that looked hopefully to me and it seems to be backed up by the quotes afterwards that he went down more precautionary than oh my i mean it certainly was nothing like the screams of agony he was in uh, at uh, the chelsea game this one was more he sat down and signaled those if to say no 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 like we stop now this isn't you know we can't make this worse um and yeah and postacoglu i asked him after the game and he said I i'm not too sure but he doesn't think it's anything too significant um and he said, so disappointing for him because he was outstanding again up till that point. And he actually said in his club interview, no use yet, but it doesn't look significant as well. So that's good. But I did think, and this is maybe a little bit of the contrary uh, Ange that we get in press conferences sometimes. For me, I thought that was a really big moment uh, when he went off 
They had Dragasin to bring in, um, which obviously is uh, an option they didn't have earlier in the season. And I kind of felt like the team saw the change, didn't feel like, oh, you know, oh dear, we've lost um, Mickey van der Ven. I swore there. <laughs> oh dear, we didn't lose Mickey van der Ven. Um, and, and now we're lost. What they actually did was he went off and they went straight up the pitch and scored and then straight up the pitch and scored again. I actually felt, I think you kind of, you mentioned there a little while ago, I thought they responded really well to that moment, which earlier in the season or certainly in other seasons where they lost a key defender might have really kind of knocked them back and made them worry, made them sit back and panic. And I kind of put that to Andrew after the game. I was like, no, nah, I don't think that was anything. I thought they were really good from the start. I was like, oh, okay, fair enough. All right. <laughs> you kind of get the impression sometimes of Andrew. If I'd said they'd been really good from the start, he would have probably said, no, 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 I thought they were really good after Mickey went off. Um, but yeah, I thought Radu Dragerson came in and the transition was seamless. And it just shows how important bringing that quality of competition in to the uh, the centre-backs. Like we were talking about the attackers earlier, to now have that in the centre-back department. And it will have been frustrating for Dragerson. Uh, Dragerson. He's come from a playing week in, week out in Serie A for Genoa, getting praise of plenty, and then suddenly kind of thinking, oh, I'm like back up here. I, I'm really having to kind of do my apprenticeship again and, and, and fight my way into this team. And then fair play to him you know other than little bits of moments here and there late in games this was his first opportunity really to to show everyone no I can step into this role you know the, the team is not going to be any weaker for me coming in for Mickey van der Ven and I thought he was excellent I thought his anticipation he showed that little bit of pace you know he's not going to be as fast as Mickey van der Ven he, Mickey van der Ven is the fastest defender in the Premier League's history so he's not going to be that fast but he was fast enough to deal with everything thrown at him. And I actually thought the thing that probably impressed me the most was his technical ability and his confidence on the ball. Whenever it came to him, he and the doggy linked up really well when they would press him, Villa. Obviously, it got easier for him about 14 minutes into his um, performance when McGinn decided to have a heads gone moment. So obviously, they had less to throw at him after that. But though no, I thought that was really, really kind of um, promising. Um, and actually, Ange, in his answer to me, said, great for Radu to come in. His first significant game time in a big game, and I thought he handled it really well. He did. He looked very composed. He didn't look worried by the scenario, the Villa crowd, anything. Um, yeah, I thought that was really important for him because, you know, the likelihood is you think, even if Van der Ven is fine, that you probably play Dragerson at Fulham now just to make sure. Uh, and that'll be a tough one, a London derby as well at Craven Cottage. And Fulham are a team that, you know, they can kind of do anything. You don't know what Fulham you're going to get sometimes in games. And, and he'll have a, a battle on his hands. I mean, what did you think of the big Romanian? Uh, performed well when he came on, you know, nice and steady uh, at the back. I think, like you said, things probably made a bit easier for him with... Uh, Spurs totally on top, Villa having uh, one man sent off in John McGinn. And, you know, you don't really want to... Th there are no positives to Van der Ven going off injured because he's no. such a good player for Spurs and you want cool. him on the pitch. But one little thing you could probably take from it is at least it gave Dragasin a good amount of game time. So I think it's just three substitute appearances for him so far. I think it was the Man U Everton and was it Burnley in the Cup? Maybe someone like that, where he's yeah. come on, or, or the Brentford, Brentford City, at home. Did he come on against, didn't come on against City. Did it might he? have been Brentford at home. I can't remember which the yeah. third one was. Because I can remember saying on the pod back in the January when there was, you know, two games in a week, this is probably a real opportunity now to play Dragerson because where, when exactly are you going to change things about later in the season when you've just got one game a week? Uh, but. No, at least he's got those minutes under his belt and everyone will just be full of confidence in him if he is to, you know, start at Fulham or start another game later in the season. It was that's... United, just to tell you, United, Brentford and Everton in the Premier League, yeah. it was, yeah. and FA Cup. He was on the bench, didn't come on against City. Weird. Yeah. I thought I remembered him coming on. Yes, yeah, so I think it's one of these, there's just positives to come from it from uh, Dragerson and now it's probably just him wanting more opportunities 
in the team, especially when you've come from Genoa, where you're playing week in, week out. You've got the Euros on the horizon, but let's be honest, probably he's going to be starting for Romania, given his quality, uh, despite his lack of game time uh, at Spurs. But it might be one of these where, say, if Dragosin does start at Craven Cottage on Saturday evening, if he puts in a really, really good performance, does Van der Ben then come back in, potentially, if if he's not in the position to play or start at Fulham on, on Saturday? Uh, you know, for a few of the Spurs players, maybe on the fringes of the uh, starting eleven, all they can do is deliver good performances. And if they do that, then they might get the opportunity to play week in, week out in the team. But I think for Dragosin, you know, good performance from him. Yeah, I mean, he and Van der Ven are both 22. This yeah. is, well, I don't think I ever felt as old as I do covering Spurs this season. There's just so many players like a doggy and um, Saar and Johnson and, and Dragosin and Van der Ven. And, you know, I could go on across the pitch. There's so many young players. And, yeah, it's just quite even like the likes of Porro aren't that old at all either. Um, it's so exciting, though. I mean, in Dragosin and Van der Ven, you've got two of the best young defenders. I mean, I've already said Van der Ven in the world, probably, and Dragosin certainly in Europe and, and could potentially be in the world. I mean, you know, there's it's it's there's a reason Bayern Munich were desperate to sign Radu Dragosin um, because he is going to be a bit of a star. And, and for Spurs to kind of have, at the moment, these three defenders all battling it out for a spot in the two spots... And you would imagine probably another one comes in in the summer um, if they don't kind of push the merits of uh, either Ashley Phillips or Alfie Dorrington. You'd imagine maybe Ashley Phillips unless he gets another loan. And I mean, you've also got, we don't know in the summer what's going to happen with, let's say, maybe Ben Davies. You know, will Ben Davies be kind of brought along as the, the potential kind of experienced centre-back fullback option? Because uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they bring in a couple of fullbacks who are more Postacoglu style fullbacks, and you know I don't know whether Davies then heads off or whether he becomes part of the centre back uh, unit, as it were. But um, I mean, just those three alone uh, are going to be huge. But European football, hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, in some capacity, will be on the table next season, and you're going to need so many players. It's a uh, it's going to be really interesting. We're going to back to the kind of days when you need to have a lot of players in different positions. And, you know, Spurs had that injury crisis they had this season and also had European matches to play at the same time. It would have been utter carnage. Um, I mean, it was bad enough as it was. But uh, to have Dragosin in there now, it's just, it's a huge kind of way to, you know, that, that could have been disastrous, Van der Ven going off at the weekend. And the fact that Dragosin made sure it wasn't shows exactly why Spurs brought him in. Yeah, very much so. It was also nice to see Pedro Porro back in the team because he has been, yes. you know, a huge, huge miss uh, over the past two games. And if he wasn't injured and he started against Wolves, he might have been talking about another win. Uh, there yeah. Just because the influence it has, you know, Emerson's a good deputy uh, to bring in really good character but he doesn't have the same attributes as Pedro Porro in terms yeah. of, you know, coming into midfield and uh, playing that way. And yeah, I agree with you. I can probably see Spurs looking at the fullbacks in the summer just so if Porro and Udogi are going to miss out at some point in the future, at least you've got like-for-like -like replacements. Uh, yeah. But both played well uh, yesterday. Porro having a hand in the first goal without a link up for Dane Kulaseski and you know, both of them defensively and, you know, going forward and just such an asset for Spurs to have really, really good players. Yeah, just just very quickly back on Dragosin because I forgot Matty Cash did attempt <laughs> accidentally to injure another Tottenham player when he absolutely hammered across into an area of Radu Dragosin that no male ever wants a football to go uh, towards and Honestly, I mean, fair play to him. He, he he was in pain. He went down to the floor for a while. I have never seen this in a stadium quite to this degree when the entire Villa Park crowd watched the replay and every male inside that stadium 
I mean, what do they have? About 45, 50,000, something yeah. like that. Every, all of them just went, oh, all in unison as they watched it back. It was horrendous. It was, yeah, right in there. Um, yeah, fair play to him. And also, you know, away from uh, painful football injuries, they got a clean sheet, which is just was so big for and against a team that not many clubs are going to keep a clean sheet against. That was only their second Spurs in the Premier League since uh, October, um, which is just crazy. It was only the Forest one as the other one, um, you know, and uh, it's testament to the the defenders. And you know, you say about the fullbacks, I thought they did really well in a lot of their defensive work. Porro. A lot of those first half moments we spoke about when Spurs slipped up, Porro was often the one back there kind of helping out. Um, certainly Romero had an iffy pass. Basuma had a terrible pass that went straight to Watkins. Um, Basuma overall I thought was okay. Uh, but there was that moment when he was, yeah, it was a horrendous pass. It was like far too close to him. But Porro kind of kept helping out and he was... Obviously played the one-two with Kulusevski for the first goal. I think he also played a one-two for the third goal as well. Um, Poro he was definitely involved in it. Uh, probably, yeah, it would have probably been Kulusevski running into yeah. the Son, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I thought he was excellent, and like we say, a doggy was was so good in the breaks forward that yeah, essentially ended up McGinn getting himself sent off for it. Um, yeah, it's just a really good performance all around. I was trying to think in my head if there was anyone that I really wasn't that impressed with, and I can't even say that. Even Vicario, though he didn't have much to do, was really brave in what he did. He did one save low down. He did one at the back post where he got his head booted into. He got a stud into it. Uh, have you seen the photo Hoybier put up yeah. after the game? With the ice back on top of his <laughs> yeah. head. It's like he's wearing like a tea cozy on top of his head. It's... Uh, yeah, that's it shows how much of a painful one. He, they slathered all the stuff on the back, so he must have had blood coming out. It must have been a bit of a cut there. Um, but yeah, that that's massive for them, that clean sheet. And uh, I need more of them, though. I know post teams are probably not going to have too many clean sheets. It's just the way they play. It does invite the odd chance. Um, but yeah, it was... Uh, yeah, like I said... I think it shows when Poro, even just one of Poro and a doggy isn't playing, how much they're missed. Um, and I do think that needs to be remedied in the summer because they are so intrinsic to everything they do. Yeah, I know a lot of people, Tottenham fans, going into the game were on about you know maybe a, a better, better revenge on Mike Cash for those, you yeah. know, challenges on Matt Doherty two years ago in a final in a Villa Park and there. Uh, Rodrigo Bentica back in November, but Andrew was asked one in his press conference yeah. about possible revenge, and they just, you know, totally played it down, just focused on the game. And the best way Tottenham could have got revenge on Matty Cash was just by winning at Villa Park, and that's what they did yesterday. That's exactly what you do in that situation: just win, giving Spurs a top four, top four boost in the process. Uh, Villa, don't know what's going to happen to them now over the next few weeks, especially if they can have European fixtures on the agenda. Uh, just need to get past Ajax on Thursday evening at Villa Park. So potentially they could have another, I think, six games in the Conference League. So six, 16 games, yeah. In total, Spurs will just have the 11. No idea when this Chelsea game will be rescheduled for. No, no idea. Maybe, at all. maybe just next season at some point. No. <laughs> <laughs> just put it off. Just give give us each team the the three points somehow. Um, but yeah, the final win yesterday that's really up the pressure on Villa now in terms of the top four. Spurs do have that game in hand at Chelsea, but let's be honest, it is at Chelsea. Spurs' record at Stamford Bridge yeah. in the Premier League era is absolutely wretched. So only the one win since '92. It's just, yeah, it's horrendous. It was at the Delhi one, wasn't it? The yeah. uh, Delhi Eric Dyer's so. long ball over the top. Delhi's yeah. control and finish. Ericsson scored a really good goal. He did. As well, didn't he? Did, he? Yeah. So yes. another repeat of that would be nice. And the goal difference swing yesterday as well, that could prove absolutely crucial uh, in what remains of the season. They went into the game, I think, was it six behind? Uh, ended up two in front. Uh, so, yeah, that's... 
you're trying to work it out, aren't you? Uh, yeah, well, was it six? I thought it was four they started by. No, I think it was six because Spurs, you had four on Villa, you take four back. I'll trust your mathematic ability over mine any day. Even though I had a, uh, my dad was an accountant, he did not pass any of the <laughs> numerical ability on to me. Yes, I mean, that could potentially have a big, big say in uh, what remains of the season, but certainly plenty of positives uh, to take from yesterday. Would you say that's the best performance on the range? He was asked this afterwards, and he wasn't sure. He uh, he thought some of the ones at the start of the season were maybe a similar standard. I would say, I guess maybe because it was concentrating the second half so much, perhaps not the most overall performance. Certainly in terms of the pressing, I'd say it's the most I've, I've been impressed, if you pardon the pun, uh, with the way that they did that. Physically, I thought they were excellent. Um, and I guess just the scale of the occasion and, and the need to, to do it in uh, Villa Park is, yeah, it can be a very noisy place and they made it a very quiet place. You know, all you could hear were the Spurs fans for long periods, you know, singing Matty, Matty, what's the score towards Matt Cash, uh, Matty Cash. Um, yeah, that's funny. What you said about that reminded me of Andy's answer on that. He did say... Um, you'd be surprised at how little that sort of stuff enters players' minds. And it's funny, isn't it? Maybe we do build stuff up as as the media and also fans about this revenge and rep- retribution. I always remember Charlie Adam and kicking Gareth Bale in every game he played against him. And then one day, I can't remember who it was, but someone injured him quite badly in a Spurs game. And obviously the most famous one is is Roy Keane and Haaland uh, back in the day. Not the Haaland that the young people know nowadays, but his dad. Um, but yeah, nobody seemed to care about Matty Cash. And and like you say, that's absolutely the best way. It was Villa who lost their heads. It was McGinn who lost his head. And uh, it just shows you how a little bit of spirit is great, but it's the ones that are the more cold and calculating that get the job done. And uh, yeah, it was definitely a, a really good performance, especially second half. <coughs> Excuse me. I thought it was really interesting that uh, it came in a week when obviously... It's fair to say there's a lot of disgruntlement among Spurs fans at at the club's decisions this week in terms of the 6% um, increase in season tickets next season. And also, probably even more so in my mind, the uh, removal of senior concession season tickets going forward from, I think it's uh, it's 25, 26 seasons for new members. Um, And also for those who currently have them, they're going to have their discounts reduced. And that one has upset a lot of people and i think rightly so because it is targeting the people who a have the lower incomes you know because obviously when you when you reach that kind of age 66 onwards you're not going to have most people aren't going to have the same income and also you're attacking loyalty you know you're attacking the people that have supported the club for you know decades who have finally reached that point that they still want to keep watching them um and in the past it's been financially easier for them to do so in keeping with their situation and the club have decided well Arsenal have done it we can get away with it too and it's like I mean their logic is it's unsustainable there's four times as many senior concession season tickets at the new stadium as there were at White Hart Lane and it's just there's just too many but I'm sorry I'm sure that some kind of compromise could be found because it just seems it just seems like a classic Spurs own goal and I just thought it was just very fitting that once again, Postacoglu's kind of had to bail them out a bit. It's like, It happened in July. Back in July, there was all this goodwill growing. And it was like, yes, the Postacoglu team is looking quite exciting in pre-season. He's saying all the right words. And then the Spurs came out and went, oh, yeah, by the way, we're putting up match day ticket prices. It was like, oh, you're what? They're already like the most expensive in the Premier League or among the most expensive. Um and he had to then come out. The start of the season was incredible when people thought, like, oh, okay, well, fair enough. This is a team that he's kind of making us proud of again. And this has felt like this again this week. It's like, you know, the club's made decisions that are not popular. I can kind of just about understand. If you're going to go with just the price increase, I can understand that, yes, they've only done it once in the last half a decade. Everyone else pretty much is raising their prices around the the Premier League, I mean, you were telling me that your Everton season ticket has gone up in the last couple of years and will continue to go up. 
Uh, Villa was 15% price increase last year, and I think there's more to come. Arsenal, I think it's something like, including the European games, ends up about a 10% price increase. So I don't think, as a, annoying as it is because they are already the most, ex- or up there with the most expensive seats and tickets around Spurs, I can kind of understand how they could justify the the, the increase, you know, especially if, You've got people saying that they want, um, you know, bigger transfers, things like that. Although you could quite rightly say it's about two and a half, three million is the difference. Is that really the biggest kind of thing that Spurs need right now? Uh, but for me, it's those senior tickets. That for me is the one that I think is going to stick in the craw for a lot of people. Um, but yeah, as I said, needs Postacoglu and his team to come out. He was asked about it on Friday and he said very much, look, I'm not going to tell people how to feel. If you want to feel angry about something, feel angry about it. You've got every right to feel angry about it, which I'm sure went down absolutely awfully at the top of the club. <laughs> they were like, no, don't tell, don't tell them to be angry. Um, but as he said as well, it's my role to create a team that they enjoy and that makes them smile at the week, uh, at the end of the week. And that's exactly what he did this week. You know, they went away, they won 4 0. Every Spurs fan this morning will have had a smile on their face, kind of going into work, whatever they're doing, regardless of their age. doesn't matter how old they are. Postacoglu's team is still making them happy. They're not going to be penalised for being older. Um, and, yeah, I just thought that was really interesting, the timing of it all. Um, and I'm intrigued to see kind of how that works in the future and how that kind of boils and bubbles under and the next time that there is a poor performance uh, how the fans react, and, and that uh, especially at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Yeah, so big win yesterday. I think it's probably you're only going to look at it as a big win later in the season if Spurs do, you know, manage to get fourth. If not, the result really won't mean anything. But Spurs have certainly made it a lot more interesting now going into the final eleven games uh, for themselves. Villa having ten more on the agenda, and Villa got a bit of a tough running. Same as Spurs, I think Villa have City and Arsenal away to come. Liverpool at home in the penultimate game of the season. Factor in potential European games. Spurs not having any. You know, things could you know work in Tottenham's favour in what remains of the season. One more thing before we go, Ali. I know you've uh, been having a listen to Richarlison and Emerson today. I believe you weren't using the English subtitles; you just <laughs> transcribed it. My incredible grasp of Portuguese, <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Uh, it was really good. It was really. I, I do kind of. Uh, I do suggest people can watch it if, if they can people might remember we got the little clip um a couple of weeks back didn't we of it was the one where richarlison was talking about his rather awkward team I think meeting it was with last week wasn't it last week yeah. yeah and so now they've released like the full video of this chat with a, a brazilian influencer called fred on his youtube channel and it's a really nice it's about just under an hour long it's just richarlison emerson sitting on emerson's couch we always call him Emerson, but technically everyone that I know Brazilian that talks about him, they call him Royale. And in this video, he refers to himself as Royale, and so do everyone in it. I don't wonder whether we need to start thinking about whether that's the uh, we're doing it the right way around or not. Um, but yeah, for the purposes of this, I'm going to continue to just call him Emerson for this. But he came across so well, Emerson. Richardson, you know, comes across well. He comes across as a guy that clearly has had a really tough year and is a, a very more of an introvert character and a, and a shy guy that's had to be kind of brought out. He, maybe you kind of only see him out of his show on a football pitch. But with Emerson, he's just uh, seems like a really good-natured person. And the way he spoke about his part, I think, in in helping Richarlison with his mental health struggles and getting him out of his house. He said he was just a guy that would sit in his house far too much. And he's like, you know, my house is a busy place. I have my cousins over and everything. And he started to bring Richarlison out of his shell and, and brought him over to his. And just some of the stuff they spoke about was so funny, like Romero. Uh, Romero's ability to hurt you with, but by doing it legally, <laughs> he's like, he's amazing. He manages to take your the ball and your shin all in one go. It's very, very funny. Um, and how when Richardson first came, Romero would kick the hell out of him in training. And then it just got to a certain point where he earned his respect. And now Romero will not kick Richardson in training at all. 
just doesn't just doesn't do it. It's only certain people. You kind of I think I imagined him like a bit of a lamella type where everyone had to wear their shin pads, but apparently he is very focused. If you like, let's say you nutmeg him, he will come and get you. Um, but on the whole, he actually will only do it on, on people before they've got his respect. And I spoke about Basuma and how <laughs> he's a bit of a character. They would, uh, they kind of said he's the most Brazilian of the non-Brazilians, but they would never take him to Brazil because they think he'd probably get arrested in there. <laughs> that was in Emerson's <laughs> words um, because he's, uh, yeah, a, a bit of a, a bit of a character. Um, spoke very well about Son. Apparently, Son tries to speak Portuguese, tries to speak Spanish to the players. Um, I mean, that's a captain, you know, trying to kind of unite everyone, just get involved with all their cultures and their language. Uh, and Richardson was quite interesting. He said he was a, he's a real kind of guiding leader. He said maybe not as much as Harry Kane, but he talks quite a bit. And it's interesting. We kind of never really thought of Harry Kane as someone that was constantly talking and telling the team what to do, but it seems like he did. Um, it's a really nice interview, and especially when they go into both of them talk about the kind of the merits of their therapy that they've gone into to talk about the the things they were struggling with. Because I didn't realise that Emerson had a similar injury to Richarlison, a pubis injury, which was really affecting his movement. Um, and he was one of those that kind of told uh, Richarlison to try speaking to someone. Just, just a lot of these injury issues uh, they kind of believe also come from stress. Uh, and, and things like that kind of have a, a factor in it. Um, and yeah, both of them. And he says that even uh, their Brazilian mates now, after a few months kind of of Richarlison going and just speaking to someone about his life and the things that are bothering him, just completely different character. He just said he's so different the way he is and, and how happier he is and how more willing he is to talk to people, open up and share stuff just with general people. Um, and and that's great. That, that is the whole point of it. You know, there's no bad side to talking to people about things that are going on in your life. It, it, only good can come of it. Um, and it's a, it's, it is, it's a really lovely interview. You know, sometimes you imagine when they're talking to kind of like social media influencers or YouTube influencers, whatever they are, just, just influencers, I think in general, they can kind of maybe be a bit silly and stuff like that. But this is a really kind of nice chat, honest chat, among three people that kind of have, have got a good little chemistry going. Um, yeah, I recommend it. It's on the, the YouTube channel is called uh, Desimpedidos. So, uh, yeah, no, I do recommend it. Like I say, like me, you'll probably have to use the subtitles, but they uh, for 99% of it, they work really well. Right. I think we'll leave that there for today's latest episode of Golden Guest Tot Tottenham. will be back later in the week to discuss Saturday evening's Premier League game against Fulham and I'm sure there'll be plenty of other Spurs stuff to speak about as well so thank you for listening to the podcast and just keep with us at football.london for all your latest Tottenham news to get the best discount off your NordVPN plan go to nordvpn.com forward slash gold guest there's no risk with Nord's 30 day money back guarantee and you'll help support our podcast the link is in the episode description box